Hello, my name is John Zemian. I worked for the Pennsylvania Game Commission for 36 years and I'm retired now. And I want to welcome you today to State Game Lands 30 in McKean County. And the area on Game Lands 30 is called the Roger Latham Fence. And uh, it's, it's part of the history of uh, wildlife management in Pennsylvania. Every game lands in the state is a history book. Every mountain, every hollow is a little bit of a history book. And luckily on this one, we have some of the history recorded about what happened here through the years. Uh, back in the 1920s and 30s, when game lands were first purchased, this was one of the first areas bought by the Game Commission. So this game lands is over 90 years old now. And from the 1930s to the 1950s, there was an incredible deer population up here. Uh, deer, deer numbers were very, very high because of many, many different reasons, but mainly because of a lot of good habitat. If you'd been standing on this spot back in 1920, you'd have been looking at an 11,000 acre briar patch. There weren't any big tall trees in the area. It was all cut over and blackberry briars and young seedlings and saplings and shrubs were growing everywhere. Snowshoe hares, rough grouse, white-tailed deer populations were phenomenal. By the 1950s, the forest had changed. It was growing up and getting older. And deer were dying of starvation because the, the trees and shrubs were growing out of the deer's reach and the high numbers of deer were over browsing everything in the area. So in 1950, there were a lot of studies going on with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. And one of them, it's actually in this book right here called uh, The Bulldozer, Tool and Wildlife Management, was taking place right on this ridge top. And what they were doing they were coming in and taking places that had trees that were 20, 30 years old and bulldozing them over. So the trees would lay side, sideways so that deer could reach the tender tops and have browse to eat because a 30 year old tree doesn't supply anything for a white tailed deer to eat. While they were doing that, they also did areas where they cut chemical wood up here. And then they also did areas where they just cut and wasted the trees to make more food and cover for white tailed deer and other wildlife. Well, the biologist with the Game Commission back then was Roger Latham and another biologist was Stan Forbes. They decided on this ridge top to put some fences up to determine inside the fence would it grow different than outside the fence where deer could roam free. They didn't just do it on this game lens, they did it on state game lens 14, state game lens 44, and I think state game lens 29 over in Warren County. So it was a good study and they, they proved a lot of good things with it. And unfortunately, through the years, a lot of this information sits on a bookshelf and people aren't aware of it. So today, I hope we, we capture some of that information. And what's amazing is this fenced area is now 70 years old. And uh, back in 1950, when they put it up, Roger Latham came back in 1953, three years after it was put up and stood almost where we're standing here today and showed people the difference inside the fence compared to outside the fence where a lot of over browsing was going on. So with that introduction, I'd like to go inside the fence and show you some of the results. Okay, we're now inside the, the fence called the Latham fence. And one of the first things that stands out to a lot of people when they come in here is the number of red trilliums everywhere. And red trilliums, some people call them purple trilliums. Some people call them wake robins, stinking Benjamin. There's all kinds of local names for for uh, the red trillium, but there's thousands of them in here. And it should be like that outside the fence in a lot of places too. Every acre doesn't have to have thousands of trilliums, but a lot of acreage outside of these fenced areas should have hundreds and hundreds of trillions on them. And when you cover a square mile, you should find thousands of them. And not just red trilliums, but inside the fence here, we have other wildflowers like the Canada Mayflower, which is abundant in spots in here. We have the little yellow violet. We have uh, little northern white violets growing in here. Some sections of the fence had spring beauties in it. As time progresses, the red trilliums will start to die off, but then Solomon's seal will come up, which is another real pretty spring wildflower. And after the Solomon seal, the, the false Solomon seal will come up. Every one of those that I mentioned provides good food for an animal that's looking for green stuff to eat, like a deer in the springtime, or a turkey looking for fresh greens to pluck at. And, and not only are the, the green leafy tops good, many times the roots of these plants, like in a spring beauty, the roots are delicious and beneficial to wildlife. You see deer pawing the ground all the time, digging. 
they're digging out the roots of spring beauties in lots of places. And if you dig some out yourself and look close, the spring beauty has a little white fibrous root on it, but at the end of that, there's a little tuber. It looks like a miniature potato. And that's what the turkeys are eating. In other places, you have uh, spring flowers like squirrel corn. Squirrel corn got its name because if you dig the roots out, it looks like little kernels of corn. Tubers are part of the root. I've had hunters call me up and say, hey, some guy's baiting turkeys and I could see all this corn laying on the ground, you know? I go out there and it's dug up roots of squirrel corn. And then there's Dutchman's breeches. You dig them up and there are little red tubers on them. So wildflowers, like you see in this fence and then in a lot of other places in Pennsylvania are tremendous value to wildlife. I, I just can't say that enough about it. wildflowers and wildlife. They go together and they're an important food source and just an important component of the uh, ecosystem out here. So, Okay, when this fence was first put up back in 1950, uh, a tree or, or the area here had been recently cut. So if you were standing here in 1950, this was a lot of stumps. And the first thing that comes up after you cut over an area is a lot of blackberry briars. And then along with the blackberry briars, cut off stumps often send up shoots called stump sprouts. And if you look at this one tree right here, there's three cherry trees growing up and most likely that was a cut over cherry stump that sent some sprouts up. Being that it was inside the fence, the deer didn't chew off the stump sprouts. And our stump sprouts important to, to an animal like the white-tailed deer? They're very important. When you first cut over a maple tree or a cherry tree or an oak tree in Pennsylvania, it has this tremendous living root system still down in the ground that wants to re-sprout. And there's this big root system with no tree to support anymore. It sends up shoots like a red maple shoot can grow six feet the first summer. A deer can eat three feet of, of browse off of that six foot shoot and a red maple will still survive. You know, and the oaks do it, and the cherries, and, and some other maples do it. So stump sprouts are a good source for browse for white-tailed deer, and they're also a future timber crop, along with regular seedlings that get started not from stumps, but just where the seeds fell on the ground and trees grow up without being a stump sprout. So. Another important thing about the maturing forest of northern Pennsylvania is the shrub component. We talked a little bit about the spring wildflowers. Well, there's also summer wildflowers. There's also other kinds of plants, but a real important plant structure in our forests, in our maturing forests, is the shrub understory. And inside the Latham fence here, it's kind of neat because we have alternate leaf dogwood, which is shade tolerant, grown underneath these, these shady cherry and, and maple trees. And we also have red berried elder growing under here which is another shrub that's good for wildlife. Both alternate leaf dogwood and red berried elder produce seeds that songbirds like, that all kinds of game animals like, and they also are a good browse. And so outside the fenced area, you're lucky if you find any of them that get more than two or three inches tall. And of course, when they only get two or three inches tall, they're not gonna mature and produce seeds. And then inside here, you also see things like our foresters call advanced regeneration. When a logger comes into an area and, and wants to remove some timber, one of the best things they can see on the ground is advanced regeneration. That's the new forest that's gonna follow the old trees that they take out. Right here, we happen to have a red maple tree that's a little over six feet tall. When you walk outside of this fenced area, you might walk for miles and not find a red maple tree in our shady woods up here that's six feet tall because deer love red maples and keep them chewed off. And if you look hard enough, you'll also find, you'll find American beech. American beech is somewhat deer resistant and we have way too many areas that that's the only shrub left in our forest or the only small tree. We call it beech brush. And you will go hunting in places where there'll be endless, endless supplies of beech brush. You can't see 20 feet through it. It holds its leaves on in the fall. And in deer season, you see all these brown leaves in, a deer can be 15 yards away from you and hiding in there and you can't see it, but it supplies very little food. Great cover, but almost no food. So the shrub component, whether it's shade tolerant like the red berried elders and the alternate leaf dogwood, or whether it's the future forest, red maples, sugar maples, red oaks, white oaks, uh, rock oaks, all those other trees, those are all important too. So when you walk through the woods, everything shouldn't look like an open park. 
Some areas will. Some areas are gonna naturally look like an open park, but other areas should have little shrubs in them that are shade tolerant, like rhododendron, even mountain laurel, witch hazel, all kinds of different things. And it should also have the young forest, the young, the young future timber crop growing in there too. So those are real important things for people to understand about white-tailed deer management. One of the big questions a lot of people ask is how much browse do, do a deer need per day? And uh, the simple answer is probably an average of around five pounds per day per deer. But that all depends on what kind of browse is it. It depends on how big a deer are we talking about. Is it a, is it a young deer that has a smaller, uh, needs a smaller food supply or is it a mature deer that uh, it has a bigger body and needs a lot more food. So it varies, but right around five pounds. And one of the ways people can learn how difficult that can be in some areas for a deer to find is take a small pair of fingernail clippers out and you go out and you, you take a tree that would supply browse like this red maple and the buds at the end, that's already leafed out, but a deer would love this. A deer would just chomp that and it'd be gone. But these buds on the end, this is what a deer likes and it might eat the first three or four inches of that branch. And their stomachs are set up to digest woody browse. And that's a real important food source for a deer, especially in the winter, but year round, they're browsers. And in, in the summer, they're lucky they have all these other forbs that are coming up. But in the winter, when the forbs are gone and there's snow on the ground, and maybe there's no acorns or, or beech nuts or other mass crops, browse is what's important. And they need it every day. So when you're out there in the hunting season, a lot of hunters are like, man, good acorn crop, you know, great for the deer. But some places like this game lands, it's 11,000 acres and there aren't 100 oak trees on it. It's a northern hardwood forest. So there's never acorns up here. They just don't occur here. It's a cherry, beech, and maple forest. And even in the big oak woods, on some of our game lands, we have beautiful oaks and we manage to leave oaks and to supply acorns for squirrels, for deer, for turkey. Some years a frost gets them and there is no acorns. So browse is way more important and vegetation is way more important than the mass crops. The mass crops are nice when they occur, but you can't count on them. You gotta count on the, the stuff that's there year after year and every day of the year, which is browse and plants. When your deer population is high enough to remove 99% of the variety or 99% of the trilliums, that ends up with poor deer habitat. That ends up with poor snowshoe hare and grouse habitat. That ends up with even poor bear habitat. So all these plants are really important. And I always tell people, you gotta grow the plants first, and then the animals follow. An another shrub that's common in the northern forests of Pennsylvania is striped maple. And striped maple uh, grows in our shady forests. It'll grow in, in sunlit areas also. And sometimes it's considered a nuisance because it's so plentiful that it overwhelms uh, other vegetation. But it's part of the ecosystem up here. And when it's mixed in with all the other plants that are supposed to be grown here, like the red berried alder and the ferns and the, uh, the uh, alternate leaf dogwood, it, it fits right in. It's, it's part of the whole uh, ecosystem out here. So it's like anything. You want to have the nice, diverse mixture of plants in the right amounts. You don't want to have all just one kind of plant anywhere in abundance. You need that variety in abundance. Okay, and wrapping up our visit here today at the uh, Latham Fence, uh, I just want to thank you for coming here. And uh, hopefully we were able to tell you about some things that uh, will be helpful in understanding wildlife management in the future. I wish we had more areas like this, and we do. There's numerous fenced areas and demonstration areas throughout the state. There's areas where deer numbers have been balanced better with the environment, where you can find trilliums growing outside of fences, plentiful numbers of trilliums and other wildflowers too. So things have gotten better since uh, the year 2000 uh, and the deer management changes we've made. And, and they can continue to get better as long as we keep controlling the deer population and keep it in balance with the natural food supply out here. So this was just a small, this is barely over one acre site that we looked at today. I wish I had a 400 acre site like this to show you because we would have saw a much greater variety of plants than what we saw here today. 
but even on this one little acre, we saw enough to convince us that, hey, our forests can produce all kinds of food and cover for wildlife, all kinds of resources for people to use, all kinds of beautiful things to see, whether you're a hunter or, or a trapper or, or just a person out uh, walking through the woods, camping or hiking, or whether you're in the logging business. Our, our forests can support a lot of good things if we manage them properly and if we manage the wildlife that lives in them properly. So hopefully uh, today's little visit will help you understand that. And uh, I thank you again.